Let's get into the word this morning. Without God, everything is nothing. We're dealing with it today and continuing in our study from the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 3 is where we're finding ourselves. In verses 12 through 22, hope you got a study guide. And if you didn't, if you'll raise your hand, one of our fine gentlemen will be glad to assist you and help you in any way that they can. Today we're dealing with the subject, the League of Injustice. This is a very interesting study that we've been on in the book of Ecclesiastes. Solomon, of course, was uh, awesomely used of the Lord. And the things that he placed there in the Word of God for us are for our direction and admonition and encouragement. And sometimes in what we've been reading, it's been kind of heavy stuff. But uh, today, I pray that you'll be encouraged. As uh, First, let me share with you some stats concerning crime in America. You say, what's that got to do with this? Hang on, you'll find out. This is from 2015. This is just uh, uh, grabbing some figures and stats here. There were 14,000 murders in the U.S. in, tw in 2015. Nearly 116,000 rapes. Almost 741,000 assaults. Nearly 326,000 robberies. Over 1.7 million burglaries and over 5.0 million thefts. We're living in a day where I think we are looking for a hero. And it seems like that uh, there's a struggle to find a hero in our culture and our society in which we're living today. With all the events that have been going on and then recently what's been happening within the ranks of professional football that's now spilled over into high school football this past uh, Friday night, a team down, I believe, around Norfolk, they basically took the knee and would not stand and do the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag uh, or recognize the national anthem, I should say. And so, you know, it's really a, a shame of where we've gotten and where we are. But in Ecclesiastes 3 and 12, Solomon comes back with, I think, something that is more encouraging and uplifting for us. And if you've been with me for the past few weeks, we've found that in many um, things that Solomon has shared with us from Ecclesiastes, and some of them have been somewhat heavy, and some have been enlightening and encouraging. But today, I believe we have some foundational words of encouragement that God gives us in his word. And these thoughts from Solomon help us to be sometimes overwhelmed in a world that is rampant with evil. And we're living in a very evil generation, an evil time. But you know, time has continued to go on and men's hearts are waxed hard and cold towards God. And that's the world and the generation in which we're living in. In Ecclesiastes 3 and 12, the Bible says, I know that there is no good in them, but for a man to rejoice and to do good in his life. Now in verse 11, Solomon uh, said he, that God has made everything beautiful in his time. And of course, we know earlier in this chapter, he talked about time. There's a time for this, a time for that. And he went through uh, several things in eight verses that tells us about different things that, that involve in our living. But in verse 12, Solomon is encouraging us that there is nothing better for us to do than to rejoice and to do good in our lifetime. And it's nothing wrong with being blessed, is it? And it's nothing wrong with being encouraged. Then you go on in verse 13, he says, And also that every man should eat, drink, and enjoy the good of all his labor. It is the gift of God. You know, a lot of times we think, well, if you're happy and you're joyous and you're rejoicing, then, you know, you can't be a Christian. Yeah, actually, the Word of God says rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. So being, having a happy and rejoicing and a joyful heart today is a part of what God wants us to be. Nothing wrong with it. Hallelujah. But despite the evil that is in the world, we know that God actually wants us to enjoy life. And don't answer this audibly, but answer this in your own heart. Are you enjoying life or are you enduring life? You say, preacher, these are tough times. I know, but we still serve a good God, don't we? And so he wants you to enjoy life because God gives us gifts to enjoy for that very reason. Now, I often use what James said. And uh, James, he tells us, and he says, every good gift and every perfect gift comes down from heaven from the Father. So good gifts means rejoicing, blessings, things from God. And your greatest gifts are not the things that this world gave you or you acquired through wealth or otherwise. 
Your gifts came from your good gifts, your family, your relationship with God, the blessings that you have. And if you got some health, say praise the Lord on that. You know, these are the gifts that God gives us, and we should rejoice in those things. So God will give you joy in, in what you do for his glory and what you do for his praise. This is a life that is primarily focused on the Lord, that he is what your life is all about. And, and that's what you got to come to. You gotta, your life is not about everything that's going on in the world. People right now are so consumed with the elections, consumed with issues, consumed with problems, consumed with everything that's happening in our nation and even things that are happening to us in our own personal lives. But understand this. God wants you to give him glory. And when you give him glory, you give him praise, and he will reward and bless you for that. So we're given three examples of God's gifts that will help us to stay on point. And the three things that God gives us in verse 13 is interesting. He said, food. How many of you like to eat? Say amen. amen. Sure you do. So, you know, uh, you can enjoy food. Nothing wrong with that. Just don't eat hot dogs every day. <laughs> and boxes of chocolates. Amen. Uh, then he said, not only is food great, but he said, friends are good. Aren't you glad you got good friends? And I hope your best friends are your Christian friends. Amen. You know, they don't get any better than that. And then he gives a third area where we just kind of like to leave this one off. It's just because push, push this one off a tape. Hard work. You know, nothing wrong with hard work. So he says, these are things, these are gifts that we can enjoy. And these are actually blessings from heaven. You can enjoy working for the Lord. Absolutely. It doesn't become drudgery. So God wants you to focus on the good things of life rather than dwelling on the bad things because the good things are gifts from God. So he wants you to enjoy that. We may not have the finest, the biggest, and the greatest. But if, you got, if you've been blessed of the Lord, you've got a reason to rejoice, don't you? Amen. So Solomon's saying the presence of evil should not prevent you from celebrating the goodness of God that is around you. Yeah, we're living in a crazy, mixed-up world, aren't we? I mean, man, every time you pick up the headlines or every time you turn on the news, it's something. But you know what? We can still celebrate the goodness of God because God's still a good God, isn't he? Amen. So this is an anchor for, from the Lord for you and I today, that you can enjoy life and not just endure life, just getting by, hanging on. See, the world's conditioned us to that. They've come out with the posters and the cliches and, you know, hang in there and just, you know, all these things that re pulls us and pushes us to the point of... You're just basically holding on by your fingernails on the cliff in life, and that's how you're trying to get through. That's not how God wants you to live. You can live blessed of the Lord. Amen. So take time to enjoy the good things God's graced you with. Take time to enjoy being in the house of the Lord today, being with some fantastic people and enjoy his presence today. Amen. Some of you today need to start seeing more good in life than you see bad. Amen. So in Ecclesiastes 3, 14 through 15, Solomon returns to this issue of the sovereignty of God. God is a sovereign God, and he's an unchanging God. What God says he does and will do, he will do. So therefore, you've got to remember, God is sovereign over all things. Nothing catches him by surprise, and he makes everything appropriate in its time. So that's why Solomon was saying, there's a time for this and a time for that. A time to be born, a time to die. A time to laugh, a time to cry. He went through all that process. So Solomon's saying, you know, sure, look around. Things may be bad uh, in your life. You may be going, you personally sitting right here today. You may be going through some trials and difficulties and challenges in your life. But, you know, with God today, you can still enjoy life. Because you've got a God who still knows what he's doing. Amen. Praise God. God knows what he is doing. And you say, well, but why am I having to go through this? Because he wants to increase your faith and your trust in him. So every negative that we encounter, we think is a negative to destroy us. God has a positive to lift us up, to encourage us. Praise God. He's still on the throne. Amen. And praise God. He is, God is perfectly in control of everything today. We may think this world is chaotic. That's what you get when you serve sin. And that's what the world is doing. But we're serving God. Hallelujah. Praise God today. God's not taken by surprise by the things that surprise us. He already knows. And he's already made a provision of his grace to help you through those times. 
Going on to Ecclesiastes 14, he says, I know that whatsoever God doeth, it shall be forever. Knowing nothing can be, nothing can be put to it, nor anything taken from it. And God doeth it, that men should fear before him. Now, we see that word fear, and you know, our flesh reflects on fear of trembling and being scared to death. That's not what God's saying here. God is using that word fear as an element of reverence or respect. So we respect God. We reverence God. So Solomon's highlighting some of the truths that human beings have limited perspective and knowledge on. So this, this is important because if we're not careful, the evil of the world will cause us then to get in a position that we question God. We, we don't understand. And I'm sure here we are today on September the 11th. And we know what happened on September the 11th. 2001 and I, I, I can only imagine how many people ask the question why did God permit this to happen well I'm not going to answer that question for you right now stay around for the morning worship service I'm going to be preaching today a special message but here's the bottom line and I want you to get this and I want you to remember this God is not nervous about the future you know we have a lot of fear across America right now Morally, economically, just the, the whole gamut of things. God's not nervous about the future. He plans the beginning and the end. So God's got everything under control. Going back to what the scriptures declare of God, he's a sovereign God. God is in control. Hallelujah. Solomon's saying, you can't add to nor can you take from what God has already planned in eternity. Friend, listen, what has happened? God was well aware of that. What is happening? God is well aware of that. What is going to happen? God knows all about that. And I don't know about you, but I'm really glad that he's planned a great future for you and I. I'm glad this is not our final place. Hallelujah. I'm glad that we've got a better place to go and a brighter day ahead. And the way things are looking, I don't believe we're far from that glorious day when we shall see him face to face. So he's a sovereign God who sees what we don't see. See, we occu we're occupying with limitations, and, and, and we're consumed with we don't know. But God already knows, and his grace is sufficient for tomorrow, as it will be sufficient for today. But he is in perfect control of everything that comes against us in this world. God's already made an application of grace applicable to you in your need. We may not understand how evil, and we may not understand how injustice works to accomplish the plans of God, but we can rest in knowing that God is in control of these things, and Romans 8:28 is still in the Bible that all things work together for good to them that love God. Go on to verse 15. He says, that which hath been is now, and that which is to be hath already been. And God requireth that, uh, that which is past. So Solomon, what Solomon's doing, he is stepping, uh, taking a step back and he's going his, historical, not hysterical. <laughs> he is going historical from that standpoint. Solomon brings up the past and says, you know, history has a cycle. And you and I know that. It has a cycle. And in that cycle, God is in control over the human events. I mean, you read through the pages of God's Word. You see back through the pages of time and history, past. Things have repeated themselves. He, it's exactly what Solomon has been saying. There's nothing new under the sun. You know, we think, I never thought I'd see the day. Well... That day has already come and gone in history past. And it will probably come and go again because there's nothing new under the sun. And Solomon keeps repeating that phrase, there's nothing new under the sun. So God intervenes. This is the good news for us. God just didn't fling us out into, into time and say, good luck. <laughs> God, he intervenes in human history. And he is a provider and a supplier. And the evidence of that, he brings up things from the past and he reintroduces them again in the present. So God judges the sins of the past as he judges the sin of the present as he will judge the sins of the future. So therefore, God is sovereign overall. See, we kind of lost that mentality. We think maybe, God, are you up there? Uh, hello? Hello? 
He's there. And he is in control. And we need to have a holy fear of him and recognize him as to who he is. See, this is the thing. I hear people using God's name in reference to, well, God is my buddy. He's not your buddy. <laughs> and God's not your pal. Amen. And he's not the old man upstairs, as people refer to. He's your God. And we need to respect and to revere him and to reverence him and realize who he is. I mean, David even said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made by God. And it's God. I mean, he even declared, you know, I once was young, now I'm old. I haven't seen the righteous forsaken or received begging bread. You read through all the writings that, that David wrote throughout the pages of God's Word under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I mean, he just made constant declarations about that God is a mighty God, an awesome God. Is he awesome and mighty in your life today? I mean, is he, is he just another fixture in your life? Just something that you pull kind of like a rabbit out of the hat when you need him? That's not the way that we serve God. We recognize him all the time in, in everything today. So God calls us, this is really good, he calls us his children. Amen. Hallelujah. But, you know, God, we've got to understand, is above us, and we can never be fully like him because he is above us. He's God. There's none his equal. There's none in comparison to him. So God purposely realizing he works purposely in our life so that we can fear him, that we can reverence him, that we can respect him. He is the Lord who reigns over heaven and earth as the scripture declares. And let me tell you, he's still reigning. And even in the events that are taking place in our world, we are told to look up and rejoice, not look down and get discouraged. I mean, it's easy to get defeated, isn't it? But God doesn't want you to live in that way. God wants you to live in a position of rejoicing. Joshua 24, 14 says, Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Then we find also Solomon, you know, the writer of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, in, in chapter 9 and verse 10, he says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And then, of course, James says, you know, if you lack wisdom, ask of God and he'll give it to you liberally. But see, you've got to respect the sovereignty and the greatness of our God. You've got to understand who he is. And what he wants to do in your life. If you want to keep your spiritual equilibrium today in a world that basically has gotten crazy and gone mad and bad, don't fear the injustice of the world. Fear God who reigns over the world. He's still in control. He's got this, as they say. And let me tell you what, he doesn't make any mistakes. So in your anxiety level that gets high sometimes, your, spirit, your spirits get low, and your outlook, when you do that, it gets dim and defeated. Well, Solomon says, let me remind you of something today. We should not fear man. He said, we should not fear circumstances. He said, we should not fear this evil world. He says, instead, we should fear a sovereign and almighty God. Realize who he is. He's God. Amen. So there's several lessons. Now, that was just a little intro. Let me rush here. Time's flying. Let's talk about three lessons this morning, several lessons today that we need to learn. One is the reality of evil is clear. I mean, my Lord, you know that, right? Amen. So the, the reality of evil is clear. If you'll just open your eyes and look around this world, it doesn't take long to find that out and to discover that. In verse 16 of Ecclesiastes 3, and moreover, I saw under the sun... The place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. So notice what Solomon is saying here. It's, it's in the place of judgment or in the place of justice today. There was wickedness, and that is prevalent in our society of today. Our world is in a deficit and, and we've got to understand and realize that. Sometimes in place of justice, there's evil, and sometimes there is corruption. So sometimes the innocent are condemned and the evil go free. I mean, you look at some of the issues that happens within the ranks of the court system and so forth. You think, where is the justice, man? You know, really. And, and Solomon also said in places where we expect righteousness, we still sometimes find even wickedness. So men's hearts are evil upon the face of this earth. 
So the reality of evil is everywhere on this planet, on earth. Every generation faces the evidence of human depravity. Every day in this country, a child is abused. Every day in this country, a marriage falls apart. Every day in this country, a husband hits his wife. Every day in this country, a mother will choose abortion. Every day in this country, an innocent person will be murdered. Every day, there's a car accident that will claim somebody's precious life. Every day, children, this is sad, but children go to bed hungry. And every day, people live in fear of injustice. This is the world. Evil abounds in our world. You say, preacher, wait a minute. Did you say something about encouragement this morning? <laughs> I mean, Lord, you just read the, the most depressing information you can hear. Don't give up yet. Hang on. You got to deal with it all, right? The, the league of injustice is all around us, but it's in varying degrees. What Solomon's saying is, this is reality on planet Earth. This is what we live in. You may ask then, well, why is life like that? I mean, come on. Why do Christians have to go through stuff? The reason is the reality of evil today is very clear. Injustice is around us there. You know, there are times when life just isn't fair. Have you ever said that in some area, you place, a time in your life? Life is just not fair. Well, I haven't found any place in the Bible that says that it is. <laughs> On this earth, we've we got to realize today, injustice resides in our world also. All this has been the bad news. But there's some good news. Praise the Lord for the good news today. Amen. The second point is the retaliation against evil is coming. Praise the Lord. The devil's not going to win, friend. He never has and he never will. Ecclesiastes 3.17 says, I said in mine heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there's a time there for every purpose and for every work. So God is not blind to the injustice and the evil in this world. God is sovereign. He sees what we see. He knows what we are encountering in life. And as a matter of fact, God sees it before we even see it, ever encounter it in life. Because, see, God knows the thoughts and the intents of our heart. So injustice, this is good news, will not last forever. God has the last and final word. And if you don't believe that, read the last book of the Bible. Read what God says in the book of Revelation chapter 22. Got good news for you today. Want some good news? Say amen. amen. The devil's not even mentioned in chapter 22. But we are. And we got a better place to go. Isn't that good? Just because God does not act immediately doesn't mean that God is not going to act. Or God is not going to provide. Life's greatest question is not... Will God punish evil? The real question is, when will God punish evil? So sometimes God delays his judgment. You know why he does that? Because that little feeling you got there, you see it on the screen, it's because God is merciful. Not because God is unattentive. It's because that we serve a merciful God. How many times does the phrase, his mercy endureth forever, his mercy endureth forever. Aren't you glad that we've experienced the mercy of God? I mean, if there was no mercy, we'd all be bound for hell with no hope. But thank God in his mercy. That's what the cross represents. That's what the blood of Jesus represents. That's what this word represents. That's why we're here this morning. It's because we serve a merciful God. Life may fail us. Health may fail us. Finances may fail us. People may fail us. But hallelujah, God never fails us because he's a merciful God. God gives people time to turn to him. And thank God he does. And to turn from that wickedness. Thank God for every day of grace he gives us. Thank God for the presence of the Holy Ghost that brings conviction upon our hearts. I'm glad on the 2nd of February, 1975, I'm glad God brought conviction to my heart. But I'm also glad he didn't bring just conviction. I'm glad he just didn't bring the fact that I was condemned and going to hell. And I realized that. But I'm also glad, man, he brought a big shovel full of mercy. Mercy. And thank God that mercy, he cared enough for me to love and to die for me on the cross. 
So God gives people time to turn. And I'm glad we can turn. Thank God we've been seeing souls saved in this church. People turning from sin and turning to a Savior. So our assignment is not to ask God when God will judge, but to rest on the knowledge that God will judge the wickedness. All this mess going on in our world and has gone on. And as I said, history is just a, a roll over things. I mean, you read back and you think, boy, this is the worst it's ever been. You ought to go back and read some history. Things have been bad in the past too. Go back and read some of the Old Testament. Things were bad in that. Go back and read some of the New Testament. Things were bad in that. I mean, things have been bad ever since the issue that sin invaded the ranks of the living. And, and that's the culprit. Rather than being concerned when God will deal with others, perhaps we should be more concerned about when God will deal with us. Solomon said God will judge both the wicked and the righteous, and we need to trust God, and we need to be ready for the day when God inspects our lives. Because the word says there's coming a judgment day, right? That we all shall stand before the judgment bar of God. So someday we will all sing a solo before God. You say, well, I don't sing solos. We all going to sing a solo one day, I promise you. And it's not you're going to sing Amazing Grace. You're going to give an account of your life before the Lord. And there's a day coming that we shall, shall all stand before him. Amen. Doesn't the word say in Hebrews, it's appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. So we can magnify the sins of others and diminish our own sins, but God is just and holy and good. And hallelujah, God still forgives sin. Ecclesiastes 3, 18 through 20. I said in my heart concerning the state of the Son of Men that God might manifest them and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which is befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts. Even one thing befalleth them. Yea, they have all one breath. So that a, man's, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast for all his vanity. Hmm. All go unto one place. All are of the dust, and all turn to the dust again. This does not say that there's no life after death, so don't misconstrue this. Solomon's saying there is eternity, but he says, hey, death comes to everything. So God made human beings in the image, and he made us to live forever in a place. That's his desire, that we live in a place with him. But see, we make a choice where we're going to live in eternity. Not everybody's going to heaven. The only way you go to heaven is the way, the truth, and the life, knowing Jesus. So we actually are made to live forever. So therefore, Solomon is not making a case about what happens after you die. Instead, Solomon is using death as an evidence that there is coming a day of judgment that God will judge. So Solomon is saying that if you live your life without God... Think about what you have to look forward to. I tell you, if you're living your life without God, it's not going to be good. But if you've got Jesus Christ in your heart and your life, and you think, man, life sure gets heavy sometimes. But let me encourage you from the fact that this is the worst you're ever going to have it. As bad as it is. And as cumbersome as it is. And as chaotic as it is. This is the worst. The songwriter wrote, the best is yet to come. Amen. So human beings without God have two things in common with animals. <laughs> now, I'm not calling human beings animals. So don't go for him and say, well, the preacher just called me a beast. No. I'm just telling we have something in common with animals. One, we, we die just like the animals do. And second is we will return to dust, and your flesh will die and return to dirt. Remember, that's where God grabbed a handful of dirt and gave it life and breath. And man became a living soul. So Solomon focuses on the certainty of death, that certainty of death is under the sun for everybody. Apart from the revelation of God, we are all just a bunch of animals. But thank God, God has declared that we're children of the Most High God and redeemed by His blood. And then verse 21, Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth? He says, you can trust God to tell you where you came from and where you're going. So, folks, listen, this mentality of, uh, uh, of evolution and all this other weird, wacky stuff out there, God made you. You were not the result of anything stupid that science tries to come up with. 
If you look at the world, you'll be discouraged. I promise you that. Actually, death is the only true act of justice anyway when it comes to God. We die because we deserve to die. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. That's what the word says. <coughs> Excuse me. But with Christ, thank God, all of that changes. Amen. So the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So one death equals hell. Two deaths equal heaven. Praise the Lord. What do you mean? If you just die in the flesh, friend, you're going to go to hell. But when you die to sin and receive Jesus Christ, the second death, which we also call it being born again. That's what makes the difference. No Christian, no Christian, excuse me, no Christian will face the danger of hell. <clears throat> no Christian will face the danger of hell. So praise the Lord. <clears throat> if you step out into eternity without Jesus, <clears throat> Excuse me. As your Lord and Savior, you will face the eternal torment and the punishment of hell. But with Christ, God's made a way out. He's made an escape. He's made a way of redemption. If we're still not off the hook, though, because we're still going to meet God one day. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that everyone may receive the things that's done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So you will give an account to God. So one day everyone will meet God. You will either be covered by his grace, or you're going to be exposed to his holiness. So what matters is, what do you do with Jesus now? And that's what's crucially important. And let me give you the third point, and we'll make this real quick and easy. The relief from evil is comforting. Back to verse 22. Wherefore, I perceive that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his own works, for this is his portion. For who shall bring him to see what thing, uh, see what shall be after him? We can live knowing that not only will God save us, thank God, from evil, but also that God will deal with this evil world in his time. So we just have to trust the Lord. So Solomon's saying, don't let the bad things of this world keep you from enjoying the good blessings that God puts in your life every day. Look around you this morning. Look at that person next to you. Look at that person in front of you, behind you. Hallelujah. Just look up towards the heavens today. You know, man, you're blessed better than you ought to be. You really are. So Solomon said, don't let the bad things keep you from enjoying the good things that God brings into your life. Focus on the good and just leave the rest to God. He's in control. And if you're having to choose from getting bitter or better today, I hope you're going to make the right choice. Choose him. That's the best way. That's the only way. I, learn to leave justice to God and learn just to trust the Lord in all things today. God Today, Jesus dealt with the greatest act of injustice by dying on the cross and making a way of atonement for all mankind today. And hallelujah, he arose victorious in order today that our sins can be forgiven and today that he could give us a better way. Hallelujah. I'm glad that we got a better way. And I'm glad that we got a better place to go. So, friend, listen, life gets mean, tough, hard, ugly sometimes, but God's still good. Amen. Let your neighbor say, yeah, he is good. Amen. The Lord is good. And you know what's amazing about this? He wants to do good things in your life today. Just let him do it and see how he'll mightily bless you. Amen. What a mighty God we serve. This world's in a mess, but, man, we're about to leave the mess. Amen. And one day, as the old song goes, we're moving on up. <laughs> Woo! To the east side. To a deluxe mansion in the sky. My, my, my. Amen. Well, I'm not George Jefferson. And so I'm not going to leave that. I'm going to leave that one alone. But anyway, thank the Lord. We got a better place to go in the church. Say it. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings today. Thank you for, Lord, a good spirit of worship.
thank you that we can glean from your word things that bring into reality the scope of life, but also give us the, the fact that we have a sovereign God on our side that is greater than whatever we encounter and face. May you today just smile upon your people, and Lord, may you bring blessings to their heart and encouragement and strength and grace. Thank you, Lord, for your many blessings. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name, and all God's children said, amen. They give the Lord a little hand clap of praise because he's still good.